Ephesians 6, 10, and I was using this as my commencement sermon to the youth who may be graduating, moving to the next grade, moving into the workforce, wherever you are, but noted also that this is a shotgun approach because uh, Paul was obviously not pointing out any particular age categories to the church. So it's to all of us this morning, although I'm targeting young people in particular. So if you're in that category, fine. If you're not, this message is still, I trust, for you. We looked at first, the strength to stand is in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. We are in the Lord by divine grace is what this book is largely about. And so our strength comes from being in Him. Secondly, we looked at the reason we needed this strength. Because we are not wrestling against one another. We're not wrestling with people we can see. We're not wrestling with the government. We're not wrestling with politics. We're not wrestling with any things that your eyes can behold. We're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. We looked at the fact that Paul lays out a well-ordered classification system among demonic angels, starting with principalities who are over territories or dominions, then going to arche or powers, which are rulers over those territories or angels, it appears, and then world rulers and world lords. Paul uses the word again, cosmocrators. One man coined the phrase cosmocrats, who are world lords, over the realm of darkness. And then spiritual wickedness in high places, which means spiritual maliciousness. They want to do harm. They intend to do harm. And you are their target. In fact, every Christian on the planet is their target. Think of the devil and his methods. We looked at his methods, the word wiles, stratagem, schemes, plans, and the three elements, deception, by desire that leads to destruction. Think of the devil and his cohorts as skilled anglers who have spent 6,000 years studying the fish called humanity and they know the exact lure to take you down. They know the exact lure to pick out of all the schemes and stratagems out of their toolbox to take you down specifically. Don't be a spiritual, this is a Greek word, don't don't get ruffled, parents. Don't be a spiritual idiot. Idiotes is the Greek word for dumb. And frankly, young people, you can be just that. And frankly, old people, we can be just that. Because you think you can stand without this armor. And so the devil has you if you think that way. Really, in fact, beloved, we are in a spiritual hunger games. And it's real. And you're the hunted. You're the hunted. And that's what Paul is saying to this church and to us. And so now we look at the armor that will make it possible for us to stand. Because without it, you will not. You cannot. You shall not. Or I don't know what Paul means by these words. So notice the parallel first in verse 11 and verse 13. Paul in 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen to the parallel in verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. First parallel. That you may be able to stand or withstand. Second parallel. Then he changes the wording a bit. The wiles of the devil he substitutes in the evil day. In the evil day. Now there are a lot of different ideas of what this evil day is. I don't think Paul means 24 hours. I think he's talking about a period, which the word for day can mean that. In Ephesians 5, he said, Walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, plural. I think there we can nail down. He's talking about a a general time period for Christians at all seasons, all times, where through trials, afflictions, persecutions, trouble... We're living in evil days. Being ruled by the rulers of the darkness of this world. Their their rule has been continuing. Far above us, not above Christ. That's the message of Ephesians 1. Far above us, far more powerful, under the feet of Jesus Christ and therefore under the feet of the church when we have our armor on, right? 
Here, Paul uses day, singular, evil, something that's future. In the evil day coming. Now, there are a few different things, but, but I want to suggest this based on Paul's eschatology in this letter. He is telling us in Ephesians chapter 1 that a day was ending in Ephesians 1.10. The dispensation of the fullness or the completion of the seasons was coming to an end at the coming of Christ. And that, that age and ages have been closed out. But it was the dawning of a new day. You're living in that day or age called the gospel church age. It's the day the devil is most concerned with because it's the day of the advancement of the kingdom of God among the nations through the church of Jesus Christ. So what's his aim? To destroy the church and the relationships in it. To distract and cause dysfunction of the purpose of Ephesians 3.10 to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. He wants to destroy that. He hates it with all his being. And so the gospel church age is the day he is most at work because it's the day that at the conclusion of it his demise will be sealed. It'll be over for him. So thinking about what Paul said in verse 13, the evil day, and we'll, we'll, we'll make allusion to that throughout. Let's look at these six pieces of the armor. Number one, in verse 14, having done all to stand, do everything to stand, don't cut any corners, don't get lazy spiritually, do everything that Paul says here, and now stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So Paul makes allusion here to having a belt on, uh, girt about with truth. The Roman soldier would have some kind of belt, maybe to put a sword, scabbard on, or a dagger in. And so the word truth, Paul doesn't tell us with this particular piece of armor exactly what he means, but truth in his letter and we'll just have to look at some words in the letter to try to say, stay close to the context and determine exactly what he means by truth. So two ways he uses truth. Objective truth, just what is true and factual, something outside of us. Ephesians 1.13, in whom you also trusted when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's objective. It's outside of us. You just received objective truth. Facts about God in Christ and the gospel. But it's also used as subjective truth. Something coming out of you. In Ephesians 5, 9, Paul would say, For the uh, fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So you can see there, truth is something coming out of you. Like the fruit hanging on a tree, fruit is hanging on your life and, and coming out of you subjectively. Now, the fact that he coupled it with righteousness in Ephesians 5, and he's going to couple it with righteousness here, I think the latter is what Paul is after. A truth that is part of your life. Of course, that's based on objective truth, but something in your life. The word can be defined as a mode of life that is in harmony with divine truth. That is, your life, something true about you, is in harmony with the objective truth of God's word. We could call it integrity, to be Christians of integrity. Now think of integrity uh, by using the word integrated. If you were integrated, the various parts of something would be coordinated. Now in your life, there's only two parts. It's what's happening outside of you and what's happening inside of you. When those two are coordinated, you're a person of integrity. The devil wants to uncoordinate you. Three elements of integrity. One would be authenticity. You hear that word kicked around a lot in our culture. Authenticity means you are what you claim to be. See? And as a Christian, you're claiming to be something. 
most of the people in this room, I think, claim to be Christian. So outside, with the lips, you say, I'm a Christian. See, When you are what you claim to be, a person of integrity inside is coming in alignment with what you say on the outside, which means you're living a life of a God awareness and a God consciousness in your mind and in your heart. Yes, there are things going in in our heart that we have to fight against, but it's coordinated. They're, they're lining up is to be a person with their loins girt about with truth. Next, it's to be honest, a person of honesty. Honesty is a virtue where there's an inner commitment to being truthful. Honesty alone doesn't make you a person of integrity. Liars can be honest if it means personal gain or staying out of trouble. If we're all honest, we probably have done that before. The only reason you were honest, it, it advanced your cause or it kept you way out of trouble. Honesty with a person of integrity is going to be truthful when it's going to cost them something, like it did Jesus. He was a man of truth and it cost him his life. That's a person of integrity. And then lastly, sincerity, which simply means real, genuine, free from falsehood. Now this, this last element of being a person of integrity doesn't mean you're perfect and you don't have any sin, but if you're free from falsehood, that means what? You confess it. You confess sin. As the proverb says, I think it's 23.13 or 28.13, He that concealeth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. What are the two most probable ways you and I conceal sin? One is that we rename it. You don't have to confess something if you don't believe it's sin, right? What's wrong with that? I wasn't angry. I was just being directive. I wasn't gossiping. I was just trying to help out. Right? Or depending on the situation. It was okay to leave my wife, well, because of this. Or it was okay to lie here because the situation just demanded it. So a person of integrity, a person that has their loins girt about with truth, a, a, an inner commitment which is a working itself out in being coordinated in heart and life is a person that has an authentic, honest sincerity in confessing and acknowledging truth. The second way that we conceal sin is by blaming everyone else for our sins. And the devil wants you to do that. When we blame others, we're concealing sin because we're, we're pushing it off on someone else. And we can be very good at that at times, can't we? Have all the reasons why you were the cause for what I said, what I did, which is the deception of the devil. Now, that being, in essence, what truth means, and that's one of the nuances you'll find with the Greek word, how is that helpful? That seems more like a water pistol than a piece of the armor, doesn't it? I'm just going to be a person of integrity, and the devil with his lures, he's going to leave me alone. Well, let's go back to John 8, 44, where we drew the three elements of the devil's stratagem, which was deception. Jesus said, he's a liar and the father of it. Desire, Jesus said, you're of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you will do. In the destruction, Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning. Deception based on desire that leads to destruction. But right in the center of that verse, there are two Greek words that are found in our text. He abode not in the truth, for there is no truth in him. The word abode is the same Greek word for stand used three times and withstand with a prefix added. The devil didn't stand in the truth. Or in other words, he didn't hold his ground. Which implies what? He fell from his former rectitude and his uprightness. He became an apostate angel. Why? The coordinates were not aligned. He was not an angel of integrity. 
because there is no truth in him. What he looked like on the outside didn't align what was in his heart. And so he didn't hold his ground, but became an apostate. That's what he's after in your life. Without the armor, without truth, you will not hold your ground. You'll slide in the day of evil. Because inwardly there are things going on that you're not addressing that conforms to what we are outwardly. And when the devil gets you to compromise by being a person that lacks that inward integrity, in the day of evil, you fall, right? Look at this example in Acts chapter 5. Two people called, Ananias and Sapphira. Peter confronted them and said what? Why has Satan filled or influenced your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and that you kept back part of the price. What happened? Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 in the last verse had just sold land and given all of it to the church and it must have caused a great stir. Probably everybody was talking about it. Now Barnabas would not have wanted any praise, but it's just something you talk about in, in that culture when everybody was so poor. Well, Ananias and Sapphira decided they would sell some of their property, but they embezzled or kept back part of the price. Now, Peter said, it was yours and in your possession and your power. But what happened? Deception. Satan lied to them. They bought the deception. Desire. What were they after? Love of praise, love of money. Oh, it'd be nice to be praised like Barnabas was. Now, remember, he, he didn't care about that. But what, what about the money? Sell it all, keep back part of the price, give part of it, we'll get the praise, we'll get the money. Desire. Third stratagem, destruction. But in this case, God did the destroying. Now, I personally believe, can't prove it, the devil would have loved to keep those two people in the church. Can you imagine the disruption they could have caused to the early church had God left them there? He doesn't really care about getting you to leave the church. Just be a person with no integrity in it. And he can bring down churches left and right. In fact, you, you probably have heard of it. Maybe you've been in such a situation. He wants to destroy relationships. And so if we're not putting on the belt of truth and being honest, authentic, real, genuine confessing, he moves in with a deception because of desire and he starts to destroy relationships like he did or tried to do in the early church. So beloved, we need to have on the belt of truth which is based on divine truth objectively but being people of God that are genuine. We, we confess. We know we're sinners. We say we are. So you shouldn't be shocked if I can confess or you confess number two the breastplate of righteousness now again Paul doesn't really go into any detail as to what what he means here but if we again look at the way he's used the word in this letter that should help us to determine how he's using it here we just stay right in the same book and context and we can have a good grasp on how he used it well again he uses it twice Righteousness here could be imputed righteousness that we receive by faith. Uh, that, that righteousness is credited to your count apart from works, apart from any activity, any performance, any earning, any deserving. Just by faith we receive what Christ has done. It also can mean imparted righteousness or we, we sometimes say practical righteousness because the imputation of righteousness or positionally will always lead to something in practice. Paul will use this word twice in this letter to refer to the practical kind of righteousness. I gave you one, Ephesians 5, 9. The fruit of the Spirit is in all righteousness and truth. Again, he couples them together. Righteousness growing on the tree like fruit, fruit of the Spirit, which is part of your life in practice. 
In Ephesians chapter 4, he would say to put on the new man, which is created after God in righteousness and true holiness. The word true is the same word for truth that we gird about. And righteousness there is not imputed, it's practical. Righteousness toward men, true holiness toward God, that leads to what in verse 25 of Ephesians 4? Wherefore, put away lying, tell the truth. Put away corrupt communication, speak that which is good. Do you see how Paul is defining it? It's a righteousness that is being worked out practically in your lives. One other proof text, not from this book, but from Paul's pen, is what Brother Titus read for us this morning. And I'll use the rest of my comments on this point from there. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul speaks of a day of the Lord, which will be a day of evil for some people. They will say peace and safety, but sudden destruction will come upon them like a woman in travail of birth pangs, and they will not escape. So he says to us, Therefore let us watch and be sober as people of the day and of the light, not people of the night or darkness. That's the people of the rulers of the darkness of this age. And what is the metaphors he uses for darkness? Because they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that get drunk are drunken in the night. What's the common thing between those two metaphors that he's using an altered state of consciousness living in a dream world a drunken person's mental faculties are not functioning and so these people are living outside the reality of God in Christ and the gospel okay, so Paul is saying there's a, a day of the Lord coming it's going to be a day of evil for some in that chapter Then he says, let us watch and be sober. Let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Why? For God has not appointed you to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so the armor there. There's no reason to suggest Paul would be thinking differently there. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Same breastplate protects the vital organs of the heart and the visceral, and he calls it faith and love. Faith and love. See, the practical righteousness that Paul is aiming at is love. It's love. Now again, how does that help? You know, I mean, these powerful beings, and he, he tempts you and you say, you can't touch me, I'm loving my neighbor. I am, I am mowing this guy's lawn, I'm helping him out, so be gone devil not what Paul's aiming at, is it? See, when the New Testament writers are going to sum the entire law, they will often do it with loving your neighbor. You ever notice that? We've talked about that. The whole law is summed up in the second great command. And the reason is, is that you cannot do the second one without the first one, which is love for God. Love for God. The power of loving your neighbor is loving God. So what Paul is saying with the breastplate in 1 Thessalonians 5 is, don't be pulled away from the pathway of faith and love by people saying peace and safety. And peace there, be sure, means more than just safety from harm. It means felicity or happiness. All is peace, all is joy, all is happiness. Join us. Paul says, be sober, watch, keep the breastplate on of faith and love because you have not been appointed to wrath like they have. You've been appointed to obtain salvation. So as a believer, you've obtained it, but you have not yet obtained it until you reach the finish line of faith. So the breastplate is protecting our hearts By loving others, because that's proof that we're loving God. If Paul would say the breastplate is just put on love for God, just love God, and you ask me if I love God, what am I going to say? Are you kidding? I don't love God. 
No, that's not what I'm going to say. What are you going to say if someone says to you, do you love God? You're going to say, sure I do. That's not the question Paul wants you to ask because you may not have on the breastplate if that's the only question you ask. He wants you to say, do you love other people? That's the question you've got to ask if you want to know you've got to, your armor on. I'd say yes to that all day long. But now when you start pushing in on me a little bit and say, what about your church neighbor? Are you loving other people? Now that forces me to take a hard look and say, do I have the armor on? See, Paul David Tripp defines love as a willing self-sacrifice. A willing self-sacrifice for the good of another that does not demand reciprocation or that the person being loved be deserving. You just get that from the love of God, don't you? Love does not demand any reciprocation. God doesn't demand anything from you. In fact, He demands that you never try to pay Him back. That would offend His holiness. You don't deserve His love. He sacrificed His Son. God is a God of love. Now imitate Him in love that way. If you're loving that way at all, your breastplate is on. If you're not, you're exposed to the devil's stratagem because he wants to deceive you into thinking you're okay with God if you never love anybody. He deceives millions that way. He's okay if you go to church. In fact, he prefers it. That's where he's trying to infiltrate. He wants to deceive you with desire to destroy you by thinking just church attendance is enough. That, that's all. I just go hear a sermon. Sometimes we can't even do that, right? He's seeking to destroy. You see, without this breastplate of love to others, there's a void in your heart, an empty space. Unless faith is loving God. And if faith, by which righteousness is imputed, is loving God, what's the upshot in the Bible? It always produces love to others. And so all Paul is doing is going to the, the armor of practical righteousness because when we ask that question, we're going to get a genuinely right answer about what's going on in the heart. If we start with the heart and the love of God, we could all be deceiving ourselves. In fact, there's probably been times all of us kind of got there, wasn't it? So, beloved, let us put on the breastplate of faith and love because God has appointed us to salvation. And the pathway to salvation is not loving so that we can earn it. It's loving because we have it. And the devils of hell cannot take it from you which the log logical argument then is, so put it on, right? Put it on. Number three, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Of peace. Next, he, he moves to the, to the shoes. The sandals that were worn by the Roman soldiers were made of leather, Soon Paul is talking about these particular soldiers since they were in the Roman Empire made of multiple layers of, of leather on the bottom and with uh, hollow point spikes on the bottom of the shoes to, to grip the soil. But the thing we need to know here is that the, the gospel of peace is not for proclaiming here. It's not advancing because he says, hold your ground. Now elsewhere, the gospel is for proclaiming, but not here. It's to dig your heels or your spikes into the soil of grace because the demonic world is coming for you. And you need these on to stand your ground. Stand, therefore, with the gospel of peace. Now, peace here means welfare. We mentioned it in the last point of 1 Thessalonians 5, peace and safety, felicity. But, but where is that peace, humanly speaking? 
welfare, well-being. We could even include quality of life. You've heard that phrase. I just want a good quality of life. Well, how do you get that? That's all bound up in the word peace. Well, if you ask me, what do I need for a good quality of life? Just speaking on human terms, I'm going to say, well, I need probably a good education. Even if it's through 12 grades, I, I need a good education. I need a good job. I need a good income. I need good retirement. I need a good bank account. I need a good insurance. Good wife will help. Got that one. Good family. Yeah, got that one. Good protection. Good police force. Good government. Now here's the point. The gospel of peace is going to help you stand because in the evil day, those things will be taken away from you. And that's what the devil does, isn't it? You lose those things. When you have your feet ready, prepared with the gospel of peace, then this peace is first objective in God. It, it cannot go away. It's settled. We have peace with God. But it's subjective in our inner person when we're resting in the gospel of peace so that when the evil day comes and things get ripped out of your hands, the hollow point spikes of the gospel are embedded in the soil of grace. That's something you do now before the day of evil comes or the day of trial. And it appears to be coming in our country. I don't know how far it will go, but we're, we're in sort of that day, aren't we? And so will you stand? Jesus said in John 14, 27, you remember, Peace I leave with you, my peace give I unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The kind of peace the world gives is the kind I just mentioned where your happiness is based on your circumstances. And it leaves your heart what? Distressed, troubled, and filled with anxiety. When Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled, don't let your heart be filled with anxiety, I'm giving you my peace. It means what? This is the peace you can have when all your circumstances change drastically. Drastically. Because it's not based on circumstances. It's based on the peace of Christ which is the joy of Christ, John 16, which is the love of God, John 15. The love of God is unconditional. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on your circumstances. It's the love of God. We see this illustration in Job. You remember the devil is going to try to destroy Job's peace. He said to God, does Job fear God for naught? So that's got nothing to do with peace, it's his fear. Romans 3, 17, 18. The way of peace have they not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes, because the two are closely connected. Is Job having peace in you for nothing? Genesis 29, when Laban was speaking to Jacob, he said, well, you're my kin, you're, you're my relative. Are you going to serve me for naught, nothing? What are your wages? Here's what Job is saying. Lord, we all know you pay pretty good wages. I mean, look at his circumstances. This man has peace. He's wealthy, got a good family, good wife, good job, good business, good servants, good house, I'm assuming. He's wealthy. Good retirement plan, good insurance. They didn't have insurance. Well, if he's got enough money, just pay for it. If he has a health problem. You pay really good wages, God. Change his circumstances, he'll curse you to your face. When the smoke settled and cleared, Job had his feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It wasn't his circumstances that gave him stability. It was his God. But who took her shoes off? It was his wife. Now listen, there is no indication here that there's a gender problem here. So you, you proud men don't go there, right? 
A lot of times it's the wife that's standing and the man has taken his shoes off. But in this case, she was finding peace in her circumstances. How do you know that? Just curse God and die. That's what she told Job. The devil wants you to curse God and die. That's what he wants. He wants to so shake your world. And apparently he has the power to do it, according to Job 1. And that power is not independent of God's power, but... As a secondary cause, he brought that mayhem in Job's life at the permission of God. And the devil does things like that today. It's not our job to kind of pinpoint where he is and, and, and if he's in that or not. We just know he's ruling the darkness and it's spiritual wickedness in high places and he wants to do us harm. And so to have on the gospel of peace means to be now before the day comes to be resting in the gospel of peace, having our feet shod, ready with the love of God. And these are connected. Truth, we saw breastplate of love practically is rooted in love for God. And then the gospel of peace is that God loves you. And the devil will try to lie to you in that day of trouble. How? You know God doesn't love you. Is this the way a father treats his children? What father brings up Job as a very suggestion to do what he did to him? And the lies go on and on. You have no value. You have no worth to God. Is what he wants you to believe. I, we could believe that pretty quick, right? You ever struggle with that, young person? Nobody would want me. Nobody cares about me. God doesn't even care about me. I'm a sinner. I have no worth. God has placed an infinitely valuable price tag on you by putting you in Christ. Your value is not in yourself, but it's in the person who permanently resides in you. You have value to God. He set His love upon you. That's going to keep your your sandals rooted in the soil of grace when the devil starts lying to you. And all the ways that we sometimes believe those lies. Young people, now, before the disappointment comes, and they will, won't the older people? Before you realize very shortly that your life is not going to work out the way you planned it. I hope you know that. Plan it. But it's, it's not. To some degree, it's not. Before the hardship, the disappointments, and even worse, day of evil comes. Put on the gospel of peace. In the peace of Christ, abiding in the love of God, which is not based on your performance or any circumstances. It's based on the unconditional love of God that the devils cannot destroy. Principalities and powers cannot separate you from the love of God, Romans 8, 38. And that needs to be the bedrock in that day. Because you're going to have sin, aren't you? You're going to have to deal with sin. You're going to have to confess. And so we, we rest in God's peace and God's love. Next, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So now we turn to faith as a metaphor of a shield. Now it seems as if Paul is uh, sort of making this the the all-important one. Three reasons you can see there. One is above all suggests that he's placing emphasis here It's the only piece of the armor that he explicitly states the reason for it, wherewith you can extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked. And the Roman shield covered the space of neck to kneecap. This was big curvature on the end slightly, sort of turn it to defend against the sides. How does it extinguish fiery darts? Fiery darts, inflamed missiles or arrows can be shot as a distraction to to burn things or can be shot straight at the people to set them on fire. So the illustration I want to use is that it extinguishes the fire the same way a fire extinguisher extinguishes fire. 
Now, I know Paul didn't know anything about a fire extinguisher unless the Holy Spirit told him about it, which we don't know that. But I'm just drawing this as an illustration. A fire extinguisher works by removing one of three elements in a fire. Fuel, oxygen, heat. The sword of faith extinguishes the three stratagems of the devil. Deception, desire, which leads to destruction. Deception. We noted the word for wiles is only used in Ephesians 4.13 in this same letter where Paul says that you and I be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, by the cunning craftiness whereby they strategize, same word for wiles, to deceive. Faith extinguishes deception with what? Truth. Next verse. I may have the wrong verses, but I'm in the right chapter. Next verse. But, look at the contrast, but speaking truth in love. What extinguishes the deception of the devil? We speak truth. Have you seen those pictures when the Roman soldiers will get in close and raise their shields and squat and... Provides sort of a, a force, not like the Star Wars shield, but it's a protection. We are speaking truth. Because in the evil day, I don't know which way is up. Job needed friends to come in and speak truth. They, they weren't the kind that did that. God has given the church, which the devil's trying to destroy, in our camaraderie in the battle against these spiritual beings, to speak truth to one another. So deception is extinguished by faith in truth. Number two, desire. Desire. Ephesians chapter 4 again, verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful desires or lust. Truth extinguishes deception and desire through treasuring truth. I mean, it's, it's, it's inflamed. It's fire coming at you. You have to counter it with fire of your own. And that is the superior treasure of Jesus by means of truth. He's superior than the devil's pitiful Lust that he offers us. They're just created, perishing things. And yet, we all have to admit, we, we get taken in, don't we? Desire is extinguished by faith in treasuring Jesus. Mark 4, 18 and 19. The thorny, thorny ground soil are those that hear the word of God... And then what happens? The cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things choke the Word. That's the devil's work. He suffocates the Word in your life by distractions, cares, desires, and the deceitfulness of riches. What is the deceitfulness of riches that we all buy into time? That riches will truly satisfy you, that's from hell, according to Jesus. It will not, it cannot, it shall not ever give you what, it think, what you think it will. Do you ever want to say to yourself sometimes, why am I a spiritual idiot sometimes? I can't believe I did that again. That's just our, we need Jesus, beloved. How can I stand against the deceitfulness and the desires and the deception of the devil without the armor? I cannot, and you are not, unless you're having it on. I don't think Jesus is deceiving us here. Do you? I don't think the Holy Spirit is deceiving us here. I think all this is true, and you do too. 
Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's what he's after. That's what the spiritual wickedness wants. They want you to depart from God even if you don't depart from this house. That's what they're after. How do you counter that? But exhort one another daily with what? Truth that extinguishes deception. What's next? Exhort one another daily, lest you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. What is the deceit of sin? It's going to give you lasting pleasure. Whoever sinned because they didn't want to. Now, I recognize in the heat of a moment, out of fear you could sin and it was not premeditated. But when it's premeditated, what's the cause? It's going to make me satisfied. It's going to give me pleasure. And all it does is bring what? Destruction. God has given us the insight through His Word. And then lastly, triumph. Triumph. Faith extinguishes destruction because truth is going to triumph by treasuring Christ. It's going to triumph. That's the the good news of the gospel, isn't it? Right. In love, He predestinated you into the adoption of children. In love, He brought you into His family. In love, He opened your eyes to see Christ. In love, He's holding you. In love, God is going to triumph through that love and bring you safely to the shores of heaven with your armor on. Isn't that the message? So put it on. It's been, you, you've been outfitted for it. It's yours. Having participles, having, taking, receiving the whole armor of God. Faith in this letter to the church at Ephesus is a means of conversion to Christ. It's a means of sanctification to good works by being in Christ. It's a means of access to God, Ephesians 3. And it's a means of Christ dwelling in your hearts by faith that you're rooted and grounded in what? Love. We triumph by the love of God in Christ. So faith extinguishes the three elements. Deception, desire, and destruction. By what? Truth, treasuring Jesus, and triumphing by faith in the gospel. Next, what if I don't treasure Him right now? You ever been there? What if I'm cold in heart? Well, the next piece of armor come in to save the day. Take the helmet of salvation. I remember Paul in Thessalonians 5 said, hope as a helmet for salvation. The devil in the evil day is going to try to hammer your head, so to speak. He wants you to think wrong. He wants you to feel wrong. And of course, we know when we feel cold, that's not the way we should be. Cold at the gospel, cold at the word of God. Has it not ever happened to you? Faith comes in, or hope rather than tells faith, keep your shield up. Deliverance is coming one day. Hope is going to keep faith moving ahead toward the final victory. Like the athletes tell everybody, there's only two minutes left in the game, or they hold up their fingers at the fourth quarter. I don't need anybody to tell me what quarter it is, man. I can look at the clock and see. That's not what they're doing. I mean, everybody can see how much time is left on the clock. What's the point? In two minutes, it's going to be over. After this quarter, it's all over. You can rest then. You can lay your armor down then. It'll be over. The bad thing is they might not win the game, but you will. You will will be triumphant. So hope sustains us by looking for the joy set before us even in the moment when we feel miserable and we have to I don't have any joy right now. Hope sustains us by telling faith, keep looking at the clock. Deliverance is coming both temporally, but it's coming eternally. And we will triumph at last by faith and we will be ushered into the final kingdom of God where there will be joy and pleasure as God promised. We have to believe Him. So I don't feel like it's that way. Yes, that's right. It doesn't really look that way. Yes, again. 
I believe it because he said it's that way. He said it's that way. So gird up the loins of your mind, Peter said, and hope to the end for the revelation of grace that is to be brought to you. And what will that do? It will keep you on the pathway of holiness. Because when Christ is revealed, His glory is going to be seen in such a way that's going to so overwhelm us. We will be singing with the songwriter that the half was never told. Brother Mike, you never told me the half. Yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> no man can. But it will be revealed on that day. So keep hoping. Put hope as a helmet on your head to guard against the strikes of the devil, wrong thinking, and even wrong feeling, because your mind must lead your emotions. If we live by strong emotions in the evil day, we're going to turn coat and run. And then there's the last one we'll look at, closing up here, is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I don't take the Spirit to be the sword, or you'd be controlling the Spirit. It's, it's the Word that comes from the Spirit. It's the sword that comes from the Spirit, and that is the objective truth of God's Word. Sword is a powerful tool. It is the offensive weapon we see here. It can be defensive. It's, it's effective. It's effectual. It's powerful. It penetrates. Hebrews 4 will tell us uh, it penetrates to the dividing of sunder of the soul and spirit, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. So first, the sword of the Spirit exposes us and lays us open to the truth. We need to let the Word of God, so to speak, expose what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're about inwardly, so we can be transformed and keep changing, because that's where the devil's going to attack, your inner thoughts and heart. So it, it, it's sharp to penetrate what we're thinking. Is my thinking right? Is, is what I'm feeling right? I think so. No. We keep going to God's Word and it penetrates. We, we preach God's Word. We want to preach unadulterated truth from the sword of the Spirit. Today in some churches, an adulterated gospel is being preached to appeal to the masses. The very gospel that's foolishness under those that are perishing and a stumbling block to the Jews, we cater to that foolishness because we don't want them to think it's foolish. So what do you do when you, won't, you don't want somebody to think your clothing is foolish? Well, you change your clothes and you, you get in with the times. Paul said, it's foolishness to the perishing, but it's power to the saved. So let the Word of God have its power. Don't adulterate it. Now how would you then put on the sword of the Spirit? You've got to read it first. Read it. Some of the things we've been learning in Psalm 119. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Or if you don't read the law, you... Your eyes are not going to be open. Wait a minute, God can open my eyes anytime. But what did He say? I can see things out of the Word, the revelation of God. So if you don't read it, guess what? Your eyes are not going to be open. Right. Read the Word. Just read it. That's not complicated. The Word can be complicated, but just read it. Secondly, memorize it. Psalm 119. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. See, it was hidden there from the book to the heart, which means he memorized it. Now, you young people, that's easy stuff for you. I'm 60. I can still do a little of that, but not like you can. Your minds are sharp. What are you using your minds for? Just memorize it. You probably could just read it a few times and it's stuck there. You know, parents teach them. Let them repeat it over and over again. See? 
Don't let the lies of the devil distract you with all these other activities where you're putting all your effort into some other activity or thing with your children and you're neglecting the Word of God. That's what the devil wants. Right? So you help them memorize it when they're young. Meditate on it. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, that's just a fancy word that means think about it. What does this mean? What is God telling me? Not what does this mean to me. Frankly, I don't care what it means to you, and you don't care what it means to me. What does it mean, as God wrote it, now what does he want me to do with it? How much of do we lose an application because we don't ask the question, what was God telling me today? And that conviction I felt when that was said, I think God's saying, change it. Right? Don't be that James 1 man that goes out, never gives any thought, comes back, feels good about himself. Let the Word of God penetrate. And go deep. Study it. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you meditate on it, you're basically studying it. It just means making sure we get the right interpretation. You know, why did Paul say it that way? What are the parallels and all the ways we would study? Don't be intimidated by that word. You, you young people do that all the time. I know you don't really like it sometimes. But this will benefit your soul in the way that academic study cannot, of course, unless it's connected with the Lord, right? Education is good in the Lord. And then lastly, pray it. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In the Spirit. Jude says to pray in the Spirit and he connects it with the Word of God. Here it's connected with the Word of God. So we're praying the Word of God. We're taking the Word of God and we're asking God to do what He said He would do. And we know we have the petitions we ask of Him because we know it's according to His Word. So just expect it to happen. Sometimes we ask for things and we're not sure. <clears throat> and that's fine. I don't know if He's going to heal you, but I'm, I'll sure pray for that. But we're praying the Word of God. This is what Jesus did in Matthew 4 when He quoted to the devil who was trying to deceive Him according to desire and destroy Christ. Right? He quoted Scripture because He had read it and memorized Scripture and He didn't have a book with Him. He had studied Scripture because He knew the application of the text as to what the devil was presenting. So out of His mind, He, he took a text and said, oh, this is the one that's going to work. And He applied it in His own life. And the devil left him. Jesus as a man did that. Yes, I know he's perfect. But Paul is saying our strength in the Lord is to be able to grow into that kind of person. To be like Christ. Not perfectly. But we're drawing our strength from him. Let us be a church that continues to get our strength from the Lord. Having our loins girt. Having the breastplate on. Having our feet shod. Taking the shield of faith. Putting on a helmet for hope. And taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying that God would make this all reality. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word that You give us. Uh, thank You for being faithful to us, Lord. Again, I would be remiss if I didn't confess on my own behalf and behalf of the congregation that we have not at all times found ourselves with the armor. How effective is the devil to distract us with the cares of this life? Just cares. And the desires of other things that enter in. And the deceitfulness of possessions and riches and things that we can acquire out of creation. And even some things that we need to sustain life. And yet, Lord, your word is beckoning us and calling us to find this strength in the Lord where we will be able to stand. And have done all to stand, Lord, bless us that we stand together as a congregation after these 19 years of your faithfulness. May this continue, Lord. May you bless this church to continue to be a word-centered church. May we preach the word, disciple the word, pray the word, love the word, read the word. And Lord, where you've called each person, all of us here today, to repent and change, 
May we not leave here without a commitment to do so, a resolve, Lord, for we know it will be for your glory and it will be for our spiritual good. So do this work in us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.